he did his PhD at the Johns Hopkins University. He relocated to South Africa in 1990 and worked with Johannesburg NGOs, including Plan Act during the early and mid 1990s. 90s, from the end of the apartheid regime in 1993-1994 until 2002, he was in Mandela's New South African government, authoring or editing more than a dozen policy papers, including the Reconstruction and Development Program and the RDP White Paper. He also taught at the University of the Wit. Waterstrand Graduate School of Public and Development Management from 1997 till 2004. He will talk today about the topic climate crisis and a case for eco-socialism. Uh, his work is primarily on the political economy of Africa, international finance, social, eco social development, and political ecology. I will uh, just mention a couple of books of him. Uh, 2011, uh, he published Politics of Climate Justice, Paralysis Above Movement Below. And 2006, he published Rooting Africa, the Economics of Exploitation. In 2005, he published Early Transition from Apartheid to Neoliberalism neo in South Africa. I'm very happy to have you today here and um, I'm very excited. Now you have your word, Mr. Bot. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, it has been a long time since I've really been in your community. But, you know, when I was visiting Gyeongsang so many times uh, from the early 2000s, it was certainly the most uh, exciting place uh, I've ever been to year after year to find such great Marxist scholarship uh, that transcended um, political economy and embraced the kind of political ecology that we've been interested in. And it was partly in connecting to those of you in Korea working on climate, where there was this hope that the Green Climate Fund that I'll mention would become some sort of an alternative, a climate debt uh, payment mechanism. Now, of course, that hope has been dashed because like so many things in the establishment, we can't really trust what's happening, for example, today on Earth Day in uh, Washington, D.C., where, where Joe Biden is convening uh, 40 leaders, including South Africa's leader, Cyril Ramaphosa, to continue the elite strategies, which I'm going to argue center on a kind of ecological modernization, which is, um, in a crude way, a combination of technological advances, on the one hand, and market strategies to internalize ecological externalities. The greatest uh, in history uh, certainly is climate crisis. So that's the essence of the paper. Now the paper that I've circulated will be uh, published uh, after some revisions, which I'm sure will be based on some feedback today in Science and Society, the Marxist journal uh, in the United States. And in that paper, I'm particularly interested in a debate with uh, my former PhD supervisor, David Harvey. And David Harvey, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, was very critical in thinking for us, uh, going back uh, 25 years to his first major book uh, that dealt with the environment, uh, Justice, Nature, and the Geography of Difference, uh, with what a Marxist might do when confronted with what Joe Biden is doing now. What Joe Biden is doing with the leaders of the major economies, I'm assuming, Korea as well, is trying to figure out how to make a market, a carbon market. So that's what I'll focus on. It's a big part of the paper. And that's what I want to argue we should not uh, turn to. We should be uh, doing socialist and climate justice critiques of carbon markets. So that's going to be the essence of the, of the argument that follows. But let me start with some theory. Would that be all right? I'm going to just share a few of the slides that 
uh, sometimes I find useful to illustrate what theoretically is at stake here. And I'll draw on a few uh, theorists, but particularly Harvey, um, if I can just make sure that the slide is visible to you. It is climate crisis and a case for eco-socialism. Today is a very interesting day. I mean, it shows the strengths and our weaknesses here in South Africa. I think some of you know that when I used to visit uh, uh, Jinju, it was often from Durban. Now, Durban's the third largest city. It's the biggest port in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's where today, as we speak, the activists are protesting at City Hall, partly against um, the, the Western, as well as one critical Asian uh, company that is trying to drill for offshore oil and gas. The Asian one, you probably have not heard of, it's called Silver Wave. Um, and the Western ones are ExxonMobil and Eni, and a little bit further up the coast in Mozambique, we have a, a war that's broken out last month that led to many dozens of deaths, in fact, uh, um, probably a couple of thousand, over exactly this oil and gas extraction. And that one involves um, the China National Petroleum Corporation, in addition to the French company, Total, the Italian company, Eni, and ExxonMobil. So we are in a position now of uh, ongoing battles between climate justice organizations like the South Durban Community Environmental Alliance. And um, as we speak right now, there's one of the most important networks, which is CADTM. Eric Toussaint has been one of the key intellectuals in the Committee for the Abolition of Third World Debt. And in South Africa, a group that I finished with in the paper, it's called WOMEN, Women in Mining. And these groups are today, as we speak, having their own webinar that deals with something very similar, which I won't have time to get into, but the climate debt. Polluters, plunderers, pay your climate debt to Africa. And uh, this afternoon, again, uh, uh, illustrating that there's a wide diversity of the environmental movements another webinar against the offshore oil and gas drilling that is going on increasingly on the uh, Indian Ocean coast. And it does get to what I think is my mandate, which is to return to a dialectics in which our fighting skills, um, particularly if we are uh, adherents of eco-socialism, will need to do what uh, uh, Helena Sheehan has suggested to take um, the opportunity to move from a reign of chaos, which is currently on the cards because of the climate crisis, and to achieve order and coherence. So this is the sort of challenge of the dialectics of nature, isn't it? It's to find some root. And I, I would turn to uh, David Harvey, and even though in this paper I'm quite critical of uh, his first initial effort, which is in searching to decrease the existing concentrations of greenhouse gases that are causing climate crisis in his book last year, The Anti-Capitalist Chronicles. He argues for um, an attempt to identify the so-called bionic plant, the plant that can sequester. He, he says the only way we can solve this problem is to get the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and back underground. And in the paper, you might be interested if those of you are curious about whether David Harvey's suggestion of sequestration to pull the carbon out of the ground, uh, into the ground again, um, what would uh, be the strategy? And there is in uh, the Jonas Salk Institute in San Diego, probably the most advanced experiments in sequestering carbon using a plant that can take uh, the uh, CO2 two meters deep into the ground because of its genetic modified characteristics. Now, in the paper, you can have a look um, I don't endorse that. I think that's the kind of ecological modernization, the technological fix. We have to be very careful of it. It fits within the so-called false solutions, like much of the GMO type strategies of fast growing trees to sequester carbon, again, deep rooted uh, through uh, the root system. Um, and there are many others, the carbon capture and storage strategy. There are many others um, in even uh, sort of Dr. Strangelove type experiments that are underway. For example, to, to put uh, SO2, sulfur dioxide, into the air to provide a, a sort of a, a layer of dust uh, of particles that will reflect back the sun and therefore keep the heating process lower than it would be, or to 
and other sequestration ideas to drop iron filings into the ocean, which again would sequester, as Harvey suggests, to get the atmosphere, the carbon out of the atmosphere. And what happens then is algae blooms are created, and then um, the um, CO2 filled algae will sink uh, to the bottom and sequester the CO2 safely. These are some of the schemes that uh, many of us would be quite critical of, drawing upon the um, environmental experts who have really looked carefully and don't want to see this kind of corporate experimentation. However, what he has said, which I think this again goes back 25 years to the book Justice Nature and the Geography of Difference, that what we really must see from our environmental justice movements and the groups that are very critical of the uh, false solutions but we need to organize production and distribution more than what environmental and climate justice movements ordinarily will do. They're very good at resisting at especially local level and resisting the concepts. I want to go into the, the key resistance uh, that I'm worried about. I think we need to do today because of what Joe Biden and John Kerry and the Europeans and the Chinese are doing, which is to um, generate a carbon market. And what uh, that would mean is to look at the um, rational ordering of activities at different scales. And to do that, um, to have a non-co-opted, non-perverted version of the thesis of ecological modernization. Now, um, I usually take one example and I really work that one as much as I can. What would be a non-perverted version of the theses of ecological modernization? And we may not have time to do that one example today, which is the counting of so-called natural capital, the value of resources, and the way in which we try to do it to radicalize that discourse, right? Environmental justice movement, David Harvey says 25 years ago, but I think it's still true, we need to radicalize the ecological modernization discourse. So I might give you some hints about how we're trying to do that by counting natural capital, or we would call it the, the natural resource wealth of the African continent, especially South Africa, the two and a half trillion dollars of uh, resources underground, especially now in the platinum uh, metals group. And especially with the hydrogen economy on the horizon, that's palladium and rhodium as well as platinum. And of course, you probably know that where I am at the moment, which is uh, Johannesburg, uh, underneath here, there uh, was uh, half of the world's gold at peak in the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement, which meant South Africa was allied with the US. So we have a very strong connection to the way in which geopolitics and world economics relate to resources. And I usually, uh, if there were time, would spend a great deal more effort to make the case that if we can radicalize the ecological modernization discourse when it comes to especially assessing the valuation of nature, then we come up with the concept unequal ecological exchange, which when I had a wonderful debate with our dear comrade from London, Michael Roberts, uh, a few weeks ago in this series, I challenged him to count imperialist power and surplus extraction the way that Samir Amin did at the end of his life in 2018, which would include the so-called free gifts of nature, as Marx described them, that come out of the ground. And I think it's that spirit, it's that spirit of the radicalization of ecological modernization that I do adhere to. And I would do that with particularly climate debt. So I will bring this up briefly, but I think what David had said, especially in a lecture he gave in 2019, is that if you look at the way, this is discussed in more detail in the paper, that ecological modernization might be useful in that kind of dialectic to find some order out of the chaos, um, then you might find the Montreal Protocol very valuable. And that's what happened in 1987. Let me uh, break in just a moment to tell you more about how to do something about chlorofluorocarbons that were coming from refrigeration and underarm deodorants and the CFCs that were coming up and they were opening up the ozone hole. I'll, I'll, I'll use that as the example, I think. But I do want to remind you that one of the greatest Marxist theorists, Rosa Luxemburg, was very worried by what she saw in 1885. Now, I don't know if she was uh, really working hard in uh, Poland or Germany. I, I actually don't know where she was, but this is what it looked like in um, the scramble for Africa in Kaiser Wilhelm's 
mansion, 77 Wilhelmstrasse in Berlin. Because what was happening here was the gathering up, you see the map of Africa in the background, the gathering of the big five imperial colonial powers. Um, and those were of course the host Germany, which had uh, a few small um, uh, colonial outposts and then Belgium, which had the DRC, but also Britain and France and Portugal. And those five countries scrambled to carve up this continent of Africa. And the way they did it made Rosa Luxemburg very curious. So some of her work, I think the best chapter in her book um, was to try to uncover what it was, those men, all white, no Africans carving up and making the different 54 borders of Africa. But what they wanted obviously was what you see here, the, the resources was some call it the useful Africa. That is the uh, plantations and the mines. So they carved up the continent to make countries. And we've been studying that for some time, how Rosa Luxemburg in her chapter 27 of her book, The Accumulation of Capital, really looked at the African continent and looked at the ways in which capital and the non-capitalist was a free gift of nature in addition to many disruptions of social systems and the reorganization of society, for example, with migrant labor in which capital found the non-capitalists, the um, indigenous uh, Africans, and then organized them into migrant labor into slave-like conditions for um, mining and for plantations. And when she wrote in 1913 in her book, The Accumulation of Capital, she really grounded her analysis of this kind of imperialism in the relationship of capital to the non-capitalist. Capital cannot accumulate without the aid of non-capitalist relations nor tolerate their continued existence. And what happens is capital moves into the non-capitalist, into much of Africa, into the nat natural, natural sphere, uh, but proceeds at the cost of this medium, nevertheless, by eating it up. It corrodes and assimilates in this metabolism between capitalist and pre-capitalist methods, or I would even say between capitalism and the natural resource base. And that's where we would come, as I mentioned, to critique of the sort of orthodox way that bourgeois economists especially like to think of extraction from Africa as a free gift, which then creates a GDP increase, which means you have Africa rising, right? This is the sort of rhetoric that we've had about Africa rising, which I think on a few occasions I've talked to you and Gyeong Sang about, right? The rise in the GDP. But what we find is that the GDP doesn't include the free gift of nature that Marx is concerned about, right? The resource depletion as well as pollution, unpaid women's and community work as well. As well. So there's a social reproduction gift of nature of women uh, to the uh, sort of, uh, let's say the, the reproduction system to subsidize capital. And it's all those sorts of things that we think in measuring the ways in which the North has a, an unequal, ecological, an unequal labor value exchange, as Samir Amin stressed, and as Michael Roberts discussed in this series, um, that we really need to make sure that the debt, the debt from men to women, the debt from capital to labor, the debt from society to nature, and there are several others. I would point to Ariel Saleh, an eco-socialist from Australia to help with that. Now, let me turn to where I, I'd like us to apply these ideas. And let's start with what David Harvey had to say, which is the uh, chlorofluorocarbon CFC em emissions in the 1980s were discovered to be widening the ozone hole, right? And the ultraviolet rays uh, began to come in and create uh, all manner of problems, cancers and uh, different uh, degrees of uh, ecological damage. And the, as the ozone hole particularly rose in the 80s, it required an ecologically modernized, planned global response. It required a multilateral solution that even the bourgeoisie, even the kind of most notorious political leader of the bourgeoisie at the time, Ronald Reagan, or Margaret Thatcher, or uh, Helmut Kohl, right? These bourgeois leaders who brought us neoliberalism, but even they could agree that this problem was so severe with the rise in CFC emissions and the size of the ozone hole growing, right? That they needed to cut the CFCs and in fact ban 
chlorofluorocarbons. I want to stress that the solution under ecological modernization was to ban CFCs. It was not to have carbon trading or the George H.W. Bush strategy emissions trading and emissions trading, which I want to give you a little bit of a sense of. And now that we're looking at climate crisis with all of these extraordinary, let's say, tipping points that are coming from Arctic sea ice from the perhaps cooling of Europe. If any of you are watching from Europe, you may not be experiencing global warming, but the decline of the Gulf Stream moving up, which warms Europe, and you might get you know, uh, episodes of extraordinary freezing. The Amazon still burning. That's something that Biden and the right-wing Brazilian leader, Jair Bolsonaro, are addressing. And there's a big debate about whether Biden should be offering $20 billion, as he sort of promised on the campaign trail, to halt that. Coral reefs dying off in the Antarctic uh, ice sheet. And so this is a tipping point moment where we might actually have lost control. And of course, we want, we want to keep the, the temperature rise, the century to 1.5 degrees to have a, a chance not to allow runaway climate crisis, but the stability and resilience of the planet is in question. As, uh, it's not only climate. I mean, there's also the sixth uh, mass species extinction underway. We certainly see that in uh, South Africa. Uh, the white rhino that you see in, in the photograph was very close to extinction. There were about 200 left and they were in a, a natural uh, game park called Stuschlui um, and Filosi. It's the oldest uh, natural reserve in, in the continent, 1895. I think for those of you in the US who are up early, I see Paula, um, I think that was about the time of uh, Yellowstone. So the problem of course is with, um, especially in Vietnam and China with the uh, horns of the, of the white uh, rhino and all rhinos being subject to um, medicinal and other, you know, uh, there's some you know, uh, debates about what really is happening in these markets, but it's a very serious problem. And particularly what I've argued is that in a context where in the coal country of South Africa, we need to actually address this problem of um, supporting local communities so they aren't themselves involved in the um, poaching that leads to the potential extinction of these rhinos. Um, and of course, that means halting all of the major mega projects going on. We can go into all of the, the details, but the critical missing ingredient is something that I find not just technologically within the scope of ecological modernization, but actually in the um, financial side. And that's where I'd like to now turn because I would argue that unequal ecological exchange, I think a very valid Marxist concept we can trace to Rosa Luxemburg and we can pick it up with Samir Amin. And there's a, there's a large body of, of academic literature. I would, I would count it just slightly different than many of the people who are, who are working on this topic. But it seems to me that we would want to then say there's an environmental debt, an ecological debt, or and particularly now a climate debt. And I'd love to be able to talk to you because I think here in Johannesburg, I'm in the global north and you're, uh, some of you in, uh, in Jinju, you're in the global north, and the Germans who put this lovely film together called uh, The Bill have got a, you know, it's a little four minute reminder that those of you in the global north really have a massive climate debt to those suffering the climate crisis. And in Korea, there is a, a green climate fund, right, uh, just outside Seoul, which is the global fund that's meant to be addressing the uh, financial flows from the wealthy countries to the poor countries to do mitigation, to do resilience, to do adaptation. But what it won't do, and it doesn't have enough money because not just Donald Trump, but even before him, Barack Obama and probably Joe Biden aren't financing this properly. That's the Green Climate Fund. Now, the reason this is terribly important is because this idea called the climate debt, which is not really being addressed properly, and I think should be to uh, adequately grapple with what Marxists would say is an unequal ecological exchange relationship at the heart of imperialism. That was actually left off of the Paris Climate Agreement, which is being discussed right now as a way to bolster the fiction that the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change has the answer. And we've known this in uh, Johannesburg, where I am, since 1992, when there was, a, there was a summit. And we've known it because of all of the activists all around the world. I'll point you towards the 
ejatlas.org and you'll find some uh, wonderful uh, South Korean examples of EJ movements. And the question is, have they got the capacity to challenge the next stage, what I think Marxists should be doing, which is um, to address this global scale. In other words, to do what David Harvey suggests, to, to scale up the critique. And I think this problem really began here when these five men, uh, Jacob Zuma, our president of South Africa at the time, President Lula, hopefully he may become the president again in, in Brazil if uh, Bolsonaro loses next year, and then, then President Obama, Wenji Bao, and Manmohan Singh. What they did was to adopt in 2009 several features of the um, UNFCCC fatal flaws, and I'll come to what I think is the most important for Marxists, which is the commodification strategy, the ecological modernization through the market. What they did then was to say, we'll have voluntary, they call it bottom-up arrangements. And as Bill McKibben put it, this is a league of super polluters that blew up the UN. And that's the critical moment when instead of making the cuts necessary in emissions, instead of a, a Montreal protocol of 1987 type of strategy that David Harvey points out, instead, as Lumumba Diaping, the, the, the leading African analyst said, actually, it's a suicide pact that the African government signed on to. And he actually made a, a pointed remark about one man at the core of this process who was half Kenyan, Barack Obama. What's he going to tell his daughters about their relatives' lives? They're not worth anything, right? And he, he basically um, accused the negotiators who go to these events. Um, and I'm sure he's accusing the Korean negotiators and certainly the key US negotiator, uh, Todd Stern. Um, at really being part of a, of a, of a sort of buying off and, and the South Africans as a sub-imperial power. Um, now, his language was very provocative, suicide, but this is now the language that's quite common, as uh, uh, the UN Secretary General Gutierrez has said, we're losing the fight, we have to change the status quo. Now, here's the, the, the real point of this, right? The um, COP20, uh, uh, the COP15, um, sorry, the and COP25, uh, sorry, the COP21, we're now going to a COP26 this year in uh, Glasgow, but the COP21 in, in Paris had these fatal flaws, right? As I've already mentioned, there wasn't sufficient emission reductions requirements, no accountability mechanisms. If you drop out as Donald Trump did, no penalties. Um, now, here's the critical one when it comes to carbon taxation, right? Um, which is if they want to put a price on carbon, there is a technique. In fact, I would strongly recommend that we have uh, border adjustment taxes and that international trade be reduced, particularly through uh, applying uh, equity and fairness, and especially putting a tax on anything from the United States, from China, that would reflect the internalization of externalities. There is, I think, a very clear role for a pricing mechanism in international trading a carbon taxation, but not the same way as was done by um, the, the French government against what then became the Yellow Vest movement or the Ecuadorian government as the IMF pushed them uh, and indigenous people rose up uh, you know, in 2017 in France, 2019 in Ecuador. But critically, as I'll point out, the carbon trading and the offset gimmickry have to be contested. That's what Joe Biden is wanting to push probably the hardest. And when you ever hear net zero, right? The net zero is when you um, can emit, but then um, you buy the right to emit, uh, you privatize the air. And in a sense, then you're taking that right from someone else. Um, and that would be the, the poorer countries who then won't emit and won't industrialize. Again, I would strongly make the case that there's a climate debt payment due by me. I had a, a you know a platinum card for my local airline for about nine years. My carbon footprint is is uh, deplorable, partly because I enjoyed coming to Jinju to be with you. Um, but you know, a climate debt is part of again the radicalization of ecological modernization discourse, as, as Harvey calls for. Um, and then that should cover the damage, loss and damage, as well as compensate for the unused carbon space, and then the job rich, just transition, the climate friendly technology without intellectual property restrictions. Now that's very, very critical. Everybody's watching the WTO this week, next week, May 5th is a critical day because of COVID-19 uh, treatment and vaccine intellectual property that the US, uh, Britain, Europe, 
Canada, Australia, and even Brazil have supported, which means we can't get generic production of the uh, COVID-19 vaccines, which means we're going to continue to see new variants. We have a terrible one coming from South Africa as well. This intellectual property, a core component of capitalist um, you know, property at the moment, uh, especially Western uh, royalties and intellectual property, that has to be contested, especially for climate, military, maritime, air transport, right? Um, and then making fossil fuel owners have a, um, uh, leaving, leaving the fossil fuels underground and recognize their unburnable carbon and, and call those what they are, stranded assets. Now, those are what I think anybody going to the United Nations to negotiate for their countries, their people, their planet, would have to adopt. Not a single one, not a single one of those basic mandates was achieved in Paris. So the UNFCCC bowed down to the interests of especially US imperialism. A guy called Todd Stern was the key manager. And as a result, the key climate scientist from the US who back in the 80s was really putting this on the map, summarized Paris in one word, bullshit, right? And I think James Hansen was correct to do so. Again, without that climate debt, and without seriousness by the negotiators who basically negotiated that, okay, you pollute, I pollute, we'll all just pollute. This is in a sense a reflection of the power of the, let's call it a, a fossil fuel plus industrial complex in most of these countries. So let's see what their strategy is. Ecological modernization is what we need to resist. And I'll just finish up with a few slides if I, if I have time. Jin Wu, I can see you. So why don't you give me a five minute warning? I flash on the screen when it's time for me to, to really start to, to wrap up. Now, the strategy of the bourgeoisie has always been to privatize everything under the sun, to privatize the air. Right, is the strategy that George um, H.W. Bush, the father of George Bush, uh, began to endorse in the early 1990s. And he did so because uh, sulfur dioxide in uh, particularly in Southern California was addressed slowly through um, a cap and trade. So you cap and then you allow people to trade under the limit to have maximum efficiency of your pollution. So he wanted this to be applied to uh, climate crisis. And by the 2020s now, okay, this is, a, I think, 2019. Uh, the uh, 2020 was a difficult year because of the uh, fluctuation in the markets that I'll show you. But uh, as I've described in the paper you have, um, the once unpopular carbon credits suddenly had become world's best investment, right? And that was partly because in 2018, as I'll show you, Europe had put um, some restrictions on how much um, these uh, uh, carbon market uh, uh, emissions credits could be issued. But it's really critical that if you, if you look at the logic, right, if you, if you want to sort of, your company, you want to pollute more, you, you have these limits in different countries, but uh, not yet the US, but you know, you basically you, have, you run into the limit and then you buy the right to pollute from some company that's more efficient, that's stayed under the limit. And this is how a Google or you know, Alphabet how um, Microsoft has some of these big companies now claim to be carbon neutral. Again, the only way to describe it is bullshit, right? Because what we look at is a moral and ethical critique, but also an operational critique. Even though carbon markets are back in vogue, and even though this conforms to ecological modernization's basic tenet, that if you have a failure of markets, then and climate change, as Nicholas Stern from Britain says, is the, is the greatest, uh, most fundamental failure of markets that we've ever seen, right? Then you need market solutions, right? That's the, that's the idea. And this is how, uh, unfortunately, quite a few um, scams have been uh, basically codified. For example, Coldplay, a wonderful band from Britain, said, okay, well, we'll do a tour and we'll be carbon neutral. But it turned out that, in fact, many of the trees that they planted actually died very quickly. And so ethically, this is what in the Catholic tradition uh, is sometimes called the papal indulgence, as you can just basically buy the right to pollute. Now, this is different than a climate debt, where you're basically told you've polluted, you must pay a fine and you must stop. Right? That's the essence of the argument for a climate debt payment. And, and what we're talking about is very different. It's about a fee that you pay to keep polluting, right? A fee for uh, ecosystem services sometimes. Uh, Mark Carney, a very important uh, a leader from in this field from uh, uh, Canada, who was a British central banker, has uh, strongly endorsed making these work. The Australian markets, unfortunately, grinding to a halt. China is a very interesting one because 
Um, they tried to put five big uh, cities together to try to make now a national market. But you can see that there's a, a sense, whether it's the voluntary markets in the US, because they don't have a national uh, carbon, let's call it a cap and trade system. But basically, this is where false solutions enter the picture. And I've already just mentioned earlier on in this discussion that there are plenty of them out there that critics of ecological modernization who are Marxists should be very wary of because, uh, you know, as I say, whether it's a bionic plant that Fred Magdoff, as I quote in the paper, is critical of David Harvey for endorsing or any one of another, a number of these techie fixes, you really have to be careful. Let's go quickly again to China. This is the number one strategy of China, carbon pricing for its carbon abatement, but they've only set the price, you can see in the blue in the left there, at six to ten dollars uh, per uh, ton of carbon. And, and we really need it to be up in the 80 to 100 dollar range in order to really get the switches to make it a disincentive, uh, in, a, in a sense, to correct the, the market imperfections. The, the basic logic is one all of you've probably heard because it's just so extreme and it's a it's kind of a wonderful case of a, of a huckster of markets, in this case, Larry Summers, who was the US uh, uh, finance minister, the treasury secretary, um, and who was delighted when Korea crashed. Do you remember in 1998 in the Korean financial crash? Summers came in immediately and said, this is wonderful. Now we have a way to wedge ourselves in and get into the cabal and buy them up. You know, and he was delighted to see the problems that Korea had in, in uh, 1998. But his most famous sentence ever, and he didn't in fact write it, a guy called Lant Pritchett, who's at Harvard, wrote it. I think the economic logic behind dumping a load of toxic waste in the lowest wage country is impeccable and we should face up to that. Africa is under polluted. Now I won't go into the details, but if you want them, he actually spends a whole memo describing them. And I think this is what a strong critique of ecological modernization, the recognition that it's impossible to radicalize this part of that tradition comes from this man. His name's Jose Lutzenberger. And he said, look, this is Larry Summers, he wrote in a memo, this is June, 1992 now, your reasoning is perfectly logical but totally insane, right? This is the unbelievable alienation, reductionist thinking and social ruthlessness and arrogant ignorance of, of bourgeois economists. And if the World Bank keeps you as a vice president, the chief economist, it shows what kind of an institution it is. In fact, Summers then left the bank the next year, became US treasury secretary by the end of the 90s, a Wall Street tycoon, president of Harvard where the faculty fired him for sexism. Obama's economics are, and last year, major advisor to Biden until there was resistance. But uh, Lutzenberger, who was the environment minister of Brazil, actually was fired for writing the memo. That shows you the balance of forces and the, the logic, right? Now, he did acknowledge he made a whopper of a mistake when he was uh, uh, then going for the deputy treasury secretary position, right? And then he said, oh, I didn't review that memo. He admitted he kind of plagiarized it from Lamp Pritchett. He didn't really review it. He was just being, he was just joking, right? It was never meant to be a serious policy recommendation. In fact, though, that's precisely the dilemma, right? In which capitalism sees the climate crisis and says, we will solve this problem, right? By internalizing the externality. Now, a critique of Larry Summers did emerge and was so strong, came from places like Greenpeace and uh, Public Citizen, very, very good groups in, in, in Washington and you know, fighting hard against, uh, against Larry Summers. And it did have the effect that he's not the Federal Reserve chair in waiting. He's not the Treasury Secretary, as many had feared. In fact, I don't, you know, he's kind of off the map. So Larry Summers rules out taking a job in the Biden administration after this critique and the reminder of what a, what a wicked kind of ecological modernization. But the dilemma is that his ideology, that strategy did prevail. And Al Gore pushed it through and said, the EU, the EU is making this innovation work. And here I come to my final couple of slides, which are maybe five or six slides, if you're still patient with me, Jinwoo. Please give me my, my five minute warning, okay? Um, now, the problem with the markets these days, or the problem generally with the internalization of these externalities, the ecological modernization strategy applied to, crime, to climate is that you're effectively letting bankers set up a market financial market in emissions. And when that happens, you can see what the logical result is in 2008. The bankers can't even regulate their own markets, can't generate stability um, and predictability in their markets. And in 2008, in the last half of the year through 2009, look what happened. 
not just to world financial markets before there was some quantitative easing support, but to the carbon market. It went from 35 euros a ton down to nine. It stayed there for quite a while. It went down as low as three euros a ton after that big crash, even when in South Africa we hosted the, the COP17 and you know, there was lots of attempts to get the carbon markets going. And then there were these reforms and then there was Brexit, but the point is none of these gave any hope during the 2010s that the markets would be sufficiently strong to bring the price up to the point where you could switch. You could logically say, this is a, an incentive now for me to switch into renewable energy or transport innovations or sustainable agriculture. In other words, the price of, a, of emitting a ton of carbon was still too low. And then because Europe put a, a bit of a, a block in, in 2018 on emissions, uh, on the, the supply of these emissions credit, then the price went up, but then look what happened in 2020. So last April, again, just to reflect the illogicality of privatizing the air as a strategy, the crash of Wall Street, the crash of the British, the European stock markets and financial markets. Um, I suspect in Seoul, you had a crash as well. That crash then led to the um, emissions uh, pricing, especially in Europe, crashing as well. And in fact, you can kind of see the exact correlation of financial market crashes with the price of a, of a typical ton of, um, of carbon. I, I provide some data in the paper to, to show you the update on that. So um, we are seeing now a bubble in the carbon markets, one that means the price is still way too low in the 30 to 40 euro range. And of course, in South Africa, we, we basically have no price at all. It's 40 cents per ton, right? It's a pathetic tax, so we, I won't even bother talking about it. But if you look around the world now, there's a, an extraordinary unevenness in the carbon pricing. And this is 2019, but it's more or less still the same sort of range. So, so Sweden would have the highest, so South Africa, one of the very lowest. And that's the dilemma that we don't have ecological modernization and a pricing strategy that can be imposed at the global scale. There's no multilateral strategy. So as China comes on board around $10, as uh, California's in the $15 range, $17, $20, I think up to $20, as Europe, uh, the emissions trading scheme is over uh, 35 euros now. It's still inadequate and it's still way too uneven, right? So we've developed critiques starting in 2004 of all of these different ways ecological modernization strategies don't work and it's impossible to radicalize them. We don't have time to go into all the details of an, a climate justice critique. This is called the Durban Group for Climate Justice. And I, I kind of strongly recommend the major text, which is a book called Carbon Trading. It's free online from Larry Lohman. He wrote that, published in 2006 by the Dark Hammarskjöld Foundation in Sweden. And it's still the finest analysis of why these markets are inadequate and corrupt and unethical. Um, we've done the same for what's happening in Africa. And we did a little film that's had a couple of million downloads called The Story of Cap and Trade. And it's in the Story of Stuff series. You can get it uh, free. It's uh, by Annie Leonard, a wonderful uh, short film that goes through why this kind of ecological modernization doesn't work. So to conclude, there are points where if you give me much more time, I will describe uh, with great passion how um, ecological modernization can help us to identify the ecological debt, the climate debt, and to demand that the payments occur in a way that give us a million climate jobs, or let's call it a climate uh, justice coalition, which in South Africa now includes the second uh, largest trade union federation and 350.org. So we're, we're beginning to see sort of eco-socialist potentials in these, as well as a group called the Climate Justice Charter. And, and one of the finest Marxist uh, um, political ecologists in South Africa, Vishwa Satkar, is a wonderful book free for download about what it is an eco-socialist strategy would be in a place like South Africa. I've done my own writing about it. And I'll, I'll conclude here just with the appeal that as these movements are emerging around the world, I mean, these wonderful Germans out there blocking, I'm sure you have uh, the equivalent in Korea, right? As the kids emerge in Fridays for Future, my dear hope is that the limits of climate justice uh, politics, which are often incapable of taking a, a strong Marxist approach to a global solution, one that finds order and chaos in eco-socialist planning from the current 
uh, disorder, right? That, that finds order and uh, uh, let's call it a, an eco-socialist strategy. And I think that's where we're going to have to work. And I think as David Harvey puts it for me to conclude now, I suppose I'm a, a few minutes over my time. What I think that can include if it's done carefully and properly is the radicalization of ecological modernization as we find a dialectic between these movements demanding climate justice with the strategies uh, that might be informed by ecological modernization from that friction, I hope, and if I haven't argued it effectively in my paper, you must help me, I hope we have a route towards eco-socialism. Thank you, comrades. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for your great talk. Shall I uh, start with the discussion first or with the uh, uh, answers? Okay, um, I have a question. Um, do you mean with the ecological modernization, the technological innovation? Is it right? And I'm wondering um, uh, if it's, um, if the um, radically, if uh, you you tell the you, you, we should combine the radicalization of ecological modernization with in, environmental justice, um, it is um, uh, it is very nice conception. But I'm wondering uh, if the technology could be the solution because if we have. Um, if you make the, the offer effort to solve uh, uh, to solve a problem, we uh, we uh, use the technology and the new technology cause another problems. The uh, technology should be the solution, but <laughs> technology mm -hmm. could be uh, a part of the problems because there are another problems that will be caused by the technology. It is not very easy. Therefore, uh, I uh, want to ask you once again, if you mean mm, this kind of technological innovation um, to be suited for to, to solve the ecological problems and um, to achieve the in, uh, environmental justice. Good, good. Should we take some others at the same time? But thank you, uh, Hyun Kang Kim, that, that is exactly the right question which is uh, the extent to which uh, what you think is a technological fix that in fact creates new problems. I'd like to talk a little bit more, but should we take some other ones, Jinwoo? Should we, should we collect a few like that? I think Mindy Ko had her hand up, yeah. Who else had their hands up? Was it Mindy? Do you want to, Mindy Ko? Or was it Anne Lee? Would you like to, to come in? If you if, if not, let me quickly address what um, Hyun Kang Him, Kim has asked, which is, are there false solutions? Okay, that's the phrase we're using in the environmental justice movement. Climate justice has been concerned, you know, for many years about what for example, GMOs, genetically modified organisms, will be doing as you introduce them through the agricultural landscape and to trees, right? To plant fast growing trees. In this country, it's usually the wattle, the Australian gum tree. And when you do that, especially with GMOs, yes, you can sequester carbon. But the next problem is what happens when, as Australia shows, is our Cape Town mountain showed last weekend, you probably saw in the international news, massive fire swept through um, the second largest city, Cape Town, where my university is based. Now, if you've got GMO trees and you're betting that they will sequester carbon because you've invested so much in a technological fix, but then a fire wipes them out. You know, again, Australian fires, California fires, then you've got not a, not a sequestration of carbon, but an actual emissions problem. I mean, the Brazilian Amazon is, is suffering this right now. I think the other uh, technological fix that I'm most worried about, because 
for those coal-fired power plants, that's 90%. My, my laptop is running right now on coal through our peristatal ESCOM. It burns coal and that's 90% of my electricity in my house comes from coal. So the strategy technologically is to sink the CO2 in a carbon capture and storage strategy to keep the coal-fired power plants going to allow the coal mines to continue. Well, again, it sounds good, but a technological fix might have a technological problem, which is the carbon can escape if it's not properly stored and can create a huge deadly plumes of, of CO2 and destroy a supposed solution. Uh, there have been many instances of this. There are plenty of these kinds of things. I mean, if you, for example, pour SO2 into the atmosphere and create uh, a layer of uh, particles, that prevent the sunlight from heating. Well, then you've got all sorts of other problems uh, in uh, manipulating the weather. And I think it's in those respects that what uh, a, a sort of technological strategy for um, the refrigeration problem that David Harvey points to, and that I think all of us would point to uh, because of the ozone hole widening because of the chlorofluorocarbons coming from the um, old CFCs, the technological strategy was to replace CFCs with HCFCs, which don't go and create ozone holes. They are you know, now under contestation. We should be banning them. China released a certain version of HCFCs that was uh, very dangerous. So they had to be kind of you know, capped again. But the ozone hole basically has stopped growing. And the, um, uh, the, the point about the technological fixes um, it has to work with a, a planned strategy. And if I'm ever asked, yeah. well, multilateral strategies are the most critical because you can't solve this problem, national unit, a state by state, mm -hmm. you can't do it locally as many environmental justice people would often want to do. They're very strong localists, but instead um, you need a, a multilateral strategy. And yet I've just gone through a presentation which said we can't trust the UNFCCC, the current group of delegates is so committed to false solutions, to market strategies, to voluntary strategies, to the Paris Climate Agreement, it's a disaster, that we can't really expect a multilateral strategy. So I think it's a, one of these moments where the scale politics are critical, and that's why a jump from an environmental justice kind of perspective, and I, I go through Andrew Jameson's sort of, uh, you know, um, a typology of what EJ is, what ecological modernization is, and why we need to transcend them and go for global eco-socialist analyses, even as the balance of forces make that apparently um, uh, quixotic. It's still uh, the right narrative that I think the movements should move towards, that is um, mixing technological strategies with banning, not market strategies, in a way that would take the best of ecological modernization and the traditions of justice and find an eco-socialist approach. That's the, that's the attempt I'm going to make in the journal Science and Society to keep this debate moving forward. Yes, Others what could be the, yes, uh, one, one more question. What could be the institution, institution who can regulate the whole things, the, mm -hmm. the global problems? What could be the intuition? It could be a, a, a bigger global institution. Do you have any idea what could it be? Well, you know, the climate justice movement in Cochabamba, Bolivia in 2009, uh, sorry, 2010, they suggested that we would need to empower a global climate court. Now, what would a court mm -hmm. like that do? One thing, it should put sanctions on the United States. I, I, I only see two people, my dear friends from the US, Paul and David, but I think they would agree with me that when Donald Trump walked out of the Paris Climate Agreement in 2017, with all its flaws, the response you know, should have been, uh, you comrades in the US, all of your movements saying, no, we need sanctions against Donald Trump and against the United States and against the products. Now, you know, that's not a particularly radical argument, it came, in fact, from uh, Naomi Klein on the left and Joe Stiglitz, uh, center left economist, and also from the far right, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy in France, the former president, said, yeah, we need uh, climate sanctions, a carbon tax against the United States and its products because it's cheating now. It's walking out of our Paris climate agreement. I think that's the right sort of question to begin to pose, which is where will there be the kinds of 
tough measures. And I am delighted that even though uh, military and maritime and air uh, uh, transport are not yet properly within the UNFCCC, there is a big discussion now about the so-called border adjustment tax and putting some kind of international carbon taxation regime into place. Look, it will have to be, uh, Hyun Kang Kim, it will have to be a United Nations strategy. And you, you are all closer to the Green Climate Fund, right? I think it's in, um, is it in Inyong? It's in somewhere outside Seoul, is that right? In one of the suburbs in the south of Seoul. And if you're watching that Green Climate Fund, that's another one that has to be, uh, in a sense, radically transformed. So it starts to ensure the climate debt that the North owes the South for, for this, you know, Marxist concept, unequal ecological exchange is, paid. And so the kind of dilemma that I mentioned at the beginning in Mozambique, we have a $128 billion of gas underneath the offshore, uh, you know, the, the, the offshore waters, and a, and a major civil war is broken out. And what we need to do is leave that gas underground. But the people in Mozambique, like the people in the Amazonian um, uh, uh, jungles in Ecuador and Peru, a place called Yasuni, they need, in a sense, to be uh, paid for leaving the, the fossil fuels underground. And there's a project to do that uh, called Yasunization, which I discuss in the paper. Um, and some of the greatest uh, ecological economists who look at the justice component of reparations for ecological damage make the same kind of an argument. So who can do it? We're starting bit by bit. I mean, the Yasunization strategy, uh, Jung Kang Kim, came from uh, the Norwegian, German, and Italian governments with the Ecuadorian president, Rafael Correa. It was unsatisfactory because what they wanted to do in paying their climate debt was to put it into a United Nations red, reducing emissions through deforestation and forest degradation, red fund, like the you know kind of carbon markets for forests. So of course the comrades in Ecuador, right, the uh, people who are the eco-feminists trying to design this and in a group called Axion Ecologica or the CONAI, the indigenous people, they rejected it. And then uh, eventually in 2013, the whole project fell apart. But you see, the point is that we, we got the early commitments going from national state elites to other national state elites. What we hadn't done was build a global movement that would recognize as an ecological modernizationist would if they were serious that the North owes a massive ecological debt to the South. Uh, and that ecological debt, I think we can start to pay in different ways. The Germans are paying it into Namibia, partly because they owe reparations for the Herero people's genocide, right? Like they've been paying to Israel for the Holocaust in, in the 1930s and 40s, but they also owe Namibia, their former colony for a, a genocide. So one of the ways is through a basic income grant to a, a place called Ochevera. So I can go into some more of the details about how we might find the seeds, the beginnings of multilateral strategies in the way in which we tackle these problems of unequal ecological exchange as Marxists or from an ethical standpoint or from the standpoint of Black Lives Matter and solidarity, plenty of ways to start doing this. I see David Lehman is probably going to, to jump in. Is that right? You've taken your mic off. And um, who else had their hand up before? Mindy, and Lee? David, okay. go ahead. Nice to see you. Um, I, I, I'm a, not an expert in this area at all. Um, so it's, this is really just a very basic question. Uh, but um, I'm a little bit aware of some of the work of Robin Hanel mm -hmm. and the controversy surrounding it. And he has argued that we socialists uh, should take uh, a more complex view of the issue of carbon trading and, uh, and, and taxation, that uh, instead of simply uh, opposing it, uh, we need, uh, in terms of the term you used before, the balance of forces that we face, you know, uh, to look at some of these proposals. It's clearly one thing to argue that the uh, carbon, the taxes and, the, and, and the, the, the emissions prices are too low you know, and are insufficient for the needs uh, that we face. But it would be another thing altogether uh, if uh, we could uh, achieve more adequate levels of these things. So I think the real question 
at least the way I like to think about it is uh, su uh, suppose, and this is in line with your idea of uh, thinking in terms of larger alternatives, you know, what would we do if we had a socialist world? You know, uh, how would we value resources uh, and putting a tax on pollution or putting a tax on carbon emissions in that context, uh, the question would have to be asked, who would control that? What would be, you know, the democratic input, input in, into it? Where would it go? You know, where, where, how, how would the, uh, 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 the income from those things be, be used? Uh, and we could, in a way, distinguish between uh, uh, the kind of uh, manipulation that goes on in capitalist circles uh, of, of, of the whole uh, uh, climate change politics process, you know, uh, on the one hand, and something that we could do with it that would be, uh, uh, that we could put forward as a, as a vision, you know. Uh, but I think the, uh, the problem you face is if you just say, we're opposed to carbon trading schemes. We're opposed to everything in, involved in that. Uh, a large sections of our potential community that we could have an impact on will be uh, will, will have the impression that we are being um, uh, sort of uh, childlike or not serious about about dealing with the problem, and we don't want to take ourselves out of some very crucial. Um, uh, areas uh, of struggle uh, by, in a sense, taking a, a, a sectarian position on on it. So that's that's the kind of thing that's weighing in my mind uh, about this. Uh, maybe. Okay. You can... Oh yeah, absolutely, David. I mean, I mean, I love this debate because it's a strategic debate, isn't it? It's about the narrative you deploy to get political uh, advance. And um, David is, is the editor of Science and Society, and I'm very delighted to be able to, to run these lines of argument. And I was inspired by the article you did last year about the strategic uh, routes in which you would you know, work on uh, transitions of firms. What I had a difference with Robin Hanel about, and this is a dozen years ago, I think we debated it mostly in a journal called Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, but I mean, we can go back. I, filed a few papers on ZNet because he and his good mate, um, uh, Michael uh, Albert, have done you know, brilliant work on participatory planning in theory. But the critical question, David, to me would be, well, the first is, is your Marxist analysis of markets such that you can identify how uh, financialization is occurring? I'm going to use my, you know, okay, my David Harvey education, which is you get an overaccumulation of capital in productive circuits, and then the financial markets start to bubble up. It happens again and again. It's a temporal fix. It's the movement through a credit system, right, of the overaccumulated capital in search of new geographical horizons, new modes of you know, accumulation by dispossession, stealing through financial markets, uh, usury, scams, and so forth. But most importantly, David, it's a reflection that through uh, capitalist history, if you allow financial markets to develop, especially if you've taken a commodity, that's just the ether, isn't it? A, a, a carbon market is really a notional. You know, it's the right to pollute. It's not a real commodity. And I don't think in my debate with Robin, especially in CNS, you know, in, in uh, Counterpunch and Znet, I don't think he ever bought that. But I think history has shown over the last dozen years since the 2008, nine global financial meltdown, that the carbon market can't um, operate outside the fictitious capital formation that is controlled by bankers. It's not going to be a sort of um, commodity that can be controlled by the state. If you give it to a European emissions trading scheme in the city of London, I mean, at one point it was in Chicago where Al Gore and some various hucksters were promoting a Chicago uh, climate exchange and it crashed like so much else in, in 2009, 2010. Um, and Therefore, that's the, the most critical flaw in the carbon market, David, that I don't think Robin buys. I, I wish he were here and we could you know, continue to debate that. But even if it wasn't the case, I would still ask the most critical, I think fatal um, strategy uh, within carbon markets, which is to reform the methods of controlling that instead of capping emissions, 
you're allowing the market to determine where the price should be, and that would be then the determinant. Now, inequality is such that those who can control those markets will ensure those of us in poorer countries will never have the money to you know, be able to buy the right to pollute. So that's one big ethical question. But even more important is whether you can identify this dilemma within ecological modernization as a reformist versus non-reformist reform. So in just one minute, if you recall, I don't, I'm not sure if science and society has grappled with this, strategic debate that Andre Gortz helped to launch in the mid 1960s in the strategy for labor. Do your reforms have within them um, the potential for a socialist transition, more or less your question, or do those reforms lock in the existing capitalist system by re-legitimizing, by changing just a little bit at the margins rather than big transformations? You can always get a, a carbon pricing that might change somebody's uh, marginal decision to do this or to do that because of the price mechanism. But now we're talking about massive transformations in systems and infrastructure and agriculture and transport and energy systems. The huge transformations we need are going to require massive state intervention, not uh, carbon markets. And it's there that Andre Gortz, when arguing for non-reformist reforms for the labor movement, identified that there are laws of motion of the system and its reproduction that a reformist reformer respects and works within, as you say, you know, to avoid being sectarian, we don't wanna go too far, you know, coloring outside our box. But on the other hand, that strengthens the system, it strengthens the logic of, of capitalism to accede to these carbon markets. And what's desperately needed for eco-socialists are non-reformist reforms that cut against the logic of the system. So for me, those would be climate debt, the, um, the caps that are required, and a fair um, uh, allocation, a reallocation of emissions, right? So that uh, very poor countries in Africa have some potential ultimately to industrialize and to move to higher levels of, of productive technologies that entail um, some emissions. Now, those are the sorts of things that are off the agenda ultimately, if you leave it to carbon markets. I don't know if I've made my case that that Robin by mistake has found a reformist reform and he's very committed to it. And I don't know what he's done the last 10 years to advance it. But I certainly think that when uh, the story of stuff came out in December, 2009, it kind of broke open a wedge within the big green movement. I mean, Annie Leonard became head of Greenpeace as she is now in the US. And it allowed us to say that cap and trade, that carbon market strategy for big greens shouldn't be tried. And the big climate justice movements and the 350.orgs and the Fridays for Future, and especially Greta Thunberg the last few weeks as she went to Davos, uh, obviously virtually, as she's made speeches recently. She's warning us about one thing above all, don't accept net zero. We need to have gross zero. We need the real cuts. We don't need to have offsets and carbon markets and other gimmicks that allow net zero as China did for 2060, as Biden's doing for 2050. You know, We've got to do much better and look at the devil in the details. Does that answer, David, a little bit? Where's Robin when we need him? <laughs> and then I should I should actually, oh, it's nice to see Karen and uh, her work in Heinrich Rolsch to is great. And they're one of the critical uh, groups that are on the edge of, do we want a market solution, ecological modernization? There's a group within there, uh, Riallos, and then there are more fundies who, we say, no, 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 no thanks for, uh, uh, for these uh, tech fixes and, and, and carbon markets. Um, but Xiongjin uh, Jiang has asked on the chat, what about the degrowth critique of ecological modernization? So instead, David, of Robin Hinnell kind of saying, you know, we need to engage with ecological modernization and accept some of the premises from the right. Xiongjin is asking, yeah, but the degrowth movement including many you know, eco-socialists who, who would be very happy to see a northern degrowth. And I think they'd also allow um, us to say, but the South mustn't be subject to degrowth. Right? This is one of the big debates in Barcelona. Can we find a Southern version? We call it the environmental justice movement and with Jean Martinez Ali and all his amazing networks in a group called the EJ Atlas. We've been having this debate, should we have a degrowth equivalent in the, in the global south? And the answer is it's very hard. I mean, you can find some of our, our work in the Journal of Political Ecology and Ecological Economics uh, journals. But the bottom line is, I think, 
Xiangjin, and I've written this in a, in, a, in a book that came out, The Political Economy of Degrowth, uh, last year, that if the degrowth people are not recognizing the laws of motion of capital and the crisis tendencies that, for example, during 2020 gave us degrowth nearly everywhere, a few countries, Taiwan, uh, I think, did Korea have a GDP growth? Um, and China uh, grew uh, one point whatever percent. But most of the world went through degrowth. And what that was, was a devalorization. Obviously it was a pinprick that came from COVID-19, but you can also argue that there's massive over accumulation of industrial capital and financial capital and commercial capital and pretty much every fraction of capital. You can see that in all sorts of ways, the over accumulation, over -accumulation of, of uh, unemployed labor. And it's that dilemma that I wish the degrowth comrades would grapple with more uh, precisely. And it's at that point that an eco-socialist planning to, in a sense, wind down the overaccumulation is so critical. There I do have some high respect for some of the Chinese bureaucratic apparatus that is closing some of the power plants and working against that. So many of the governors in different uh, Chinese provinces are still pushing uh, more coal-fired power plants, they're still building them. But it's a very interesting dilemma, isn't it? How, if you do have massive overaccumulated capital locally in Hebei province, it's polluting everyone, it's, it's, it's appalling. Um, and then I think the, the critical thing about that uh, question is, do you have in Hebei province uh, the capacity to degrow to devalorize from above, to manage, and, and you know, in, in different periods in history, big national governments, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, devalorizing the Detroit auto industry in order to try to, to get enough tanks uh, to win the war against the Nazis. Those are the ecologically um, profound questions which cannot be answered, I don't think, within a degrowth framework. I think they have to be answered ultimately by states doing eco-socialist strategies. Now, I've just come to the conclusion that um, uh, those of you who want to speak need to be unmuted. And Paul Zaremka, my friend in Buffalo, is about to uh, speak. But if the others who had raised their hand, I think that's Mindy Ko. And Anne, if you want to raise your hand again, we will, I'm sure, find a way to quickly unmute you. Paul, what's your, what's your input here? Uh, I want to ask a simple question. Uh, all of us are using computers right now, and they have lithium. Mm. Lithium is very destructive in Bolivia, Chile, Argentina. And the DRC, what, yes. So what, just stay with the topic of what do we do? Mm -hmm. When we're all oh, using fantastic. technology which uses lithium. We've just had that debate here. So let me quickly tell you where uh, the, the eco-socialist, um, I think, sentiments are. I can't say for sure. We haven't had a big you know, party meeting and a consensus. But I think the problem, especially, Paul, that you've mentioned, which is lithium coming from the brine in Bolivia, in Chile, where you have an Elon Musk who actually grew up not too far from where I am now here in Johannesburg. And he had the white male South African arrogance that you, know, you, you all know so, so well. And he said, as you probably saw on his Twitter feed last year, we will coup anyone we want. When he was asked, okay, well, why do you promote a coup in Bolivia? Well, he wants the lithium. And the reason is, Paul, I'm sure you know, he has this vision that everybody has a, a battery attached to their wall. It'll last three days. He's gonna put the batteries in the Tesla cars. And also he's gonna solve the climate crisis by having solar and wind, which have a storage problem, which you solve with lithium. And we need to reject that, don't we? For the reasons you just said. We need to look at where is lithium coming from and what is the characteristic of the extraction process and really build in all the costs, including to the Chilean people, the Bolivian people, all of the people in the Andes, and now also lithium in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Terrible conditions of mining, you know, five million people killed on the east side of the DRC as, as sort of uh, mineral warriors, uh, warlords have come up to fight for the space. Now, the critical question, Paul, is do we have an alternative to storage of renewable energy? And so the answer here, instead of going a lithium route or another route that's called car power ships, is to promote renewable energy. Um, but then to find at least two routes. One is uh, molten salt for solar chimneys, which do last. Currently, we're looking at nine hours of battery storage in the major facility in the chimney. 
in a place the northern Cape. But the second is to pump water uphill. We have a project, it's called the Angula uh, Power Scheme, where the water is pumped up um, during the day with the sun shining and the wind blowing. And then when the sun goes down, the water can come down and, and create um, hydroelectricity. So that's a, a kind of quick and dirty way to say, if we can find alternatives to lithium that can store renewable energy, let's do it. I'm absolutely with you. So that was your quick answer, but I mean, question and answer, but you know what Paul has done as well with his review of, uh, sorry, research in political economy journal. He's allowed us to have this debate and in a way that science and society that David is. And I think that's the spirit. I think if for Paul, maybe a couple of big articles I've written for you is precisely about um, advances in ecological economics that drive us towards the planning that allow, as I mentioned earlier on, us to demand an unequal ecological exchange um, reparations payment from the North for the uncompensated for depletion of resources. So if you want to look at Paul's um, research in political economy annual book, um, you'll find a couple of things of mine early on 2014 and 15, where I've been trying to figure out how do we uh, in that spirit that David Harvey challenged us in 1996, how do we radicalize the theses of ecological modernization? I don't know if I've been persuasive, but I thank David for letting me uh, have another chance at it in uh, science and society later this year. Are there any others of you or should we begin to wrap up? We've had a good hour and 20 minutes. Huh? I mean, David and Paul, I know you must be in the East Coast of the US. That's 6.20, 7.20 AM. It's time for your coffee and your breakfast, I think. You got it. Really? <laughs> uh, we I need am... to challenge our, our dear comrades in Korea. Stay up later. So you bring in more of these um, uh, sleep in Yankees, right? Okay. Who is coming in? Mindy, Mindy Ko. Yeah, actually the last one, <laughs> actually the last one is not a my hand. It was a clap emoji, but I have a question. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm unf unfamiliar with the justice, uh, climate justice, but it was re really great talk. I think it seems like a little bit a distribution problem. The, uh, have you ever seen the Green New Deal manifestation which AOC and uh, released last year? Uh, it was flashed through my mind for your talk. The environmental crisis is partially distributed inequality. Southern hemisphere people struggle with poverty, women, race, and labor class take the climate change, a uh, climate up, and the manifestations, um, manifestations, major contents are included the reconstructing the distribution. Is there a place that we can talk about the sphere for produce rather than distribute sphere? How can we map? out the climate change justice eco socialism it actually asia africa is a factor in a commodity chain uh, the international product chain make climate gap to africa and asia how can we talk about the relationship between commodity chain and um, climate just <laughs> climate gap how can we talk about the relationship between them? Well, I'm so glad you've asked because the Green New Deal opened that debate. It hasn't yet got to the point. I think eco-socialists will be happy. David and Paul, who watch Bernie Sanders and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, the key leaders, uh, Ed, Ed Markey from Massachusetts, a senator, you know, just a couple of days ago, they've kind of relaunched the strategy. Um, but it, has, it does have problems, Mindy, and, and those are the ones you've pointed to. There's an international division of labor. Um, is that a set of global value chains? I might just throw out a statistic because I read McKinsey reports. So McKinsey is you know, very concerned with promoting globalization of corporates. And they're very worried because what used to be 28% of all manufactured goods working through global value chains in you know, a global assembly line. So in Korea, you get some manufacturer here in South Africa, we screw the, you know, things together, we get to use some leather products, but that, that sort of global value chain had been growing and growing until 
deglobalization began. Well, what is that? It's not just Donald Trump and Brexit and COVID-19. The deglobalization idea and the deconstruction of global value chains and the return to localized production networks began in 2007. That was the year that every single indicator of corporate globalization, what are those? Trade to GDP, FDI, foreign direct investment to GDP, cross-border financial flows to GDP, every single one of those major indicators of economic globalization peaked in 2007. You can look at the UNCTAD uh, Trade uh, and Development Report to find the, you know, the very latest. I mean, 2020 is a, is a crash, but the actual peak in 2007 is very revealing because um, just to hit McKinsey and global value chains, a couple of years ago, they put out a report saying, this is terrible. We just looked at the global value chains. They were 28% of all manufactured goods, but now they're down to 20, right? So even uh, global value chain uh, uh, promotion in McKinsey uh, has to acknowledge, well, okay, it's not actually uh, working. And the advent of the so-called fourth industrial revolution, you all have different names for technological change, but one of those critical aspects is 3D printing which can be done locally. We can do it here in Johannesburg. We can print more or less anything. And that 3D printing is a boost to deglobalization of capital. Not only you know, the, the sort of a tyranny that we've begun to see against workers, but there's some potential through localization. Siongjin, this is, I think, where the degrowth people you know, will be very important to work with us on what would be a relocalized, more coherent, less expansive, um, global value chain, one that now promotes localization and a, an appropriate environmentally coherent reindustrialization. And I think therefore, Mindy, this is one of the great questions that the Green New Deal must now address. It's their international obligations. Bernie Sanders was very eloquent on this. I think they threw out the figure, we'll give $200 billion to the Green Climate Fund. Uh, this is much more generous than anybody ever has suggested. We, we, you know, they, they were basically acknowledging it. But the letter that went out today uh, to Joe Biden from um, two members of Congress and you know, leading it, I, we can go into the details if you like. I, I have an article lined up for Counterpunch as soon as we know what happens in this, which goes into a critique of this. They won't do that. They won't uh, deconstruct the international division of labor. They won't break down. So I would turn to somebody I don't always agree with, uh, Tom Athanasia, and his group is called Eco Equity. And they're the ones who've motivated to say, this is what we owe. And they're the ones who say, we actually must have a 195% cut in our emissions. Wait a minute, but that doesn't make sense. You can only cut 100%. What do you do? Well, then you buy the right to pollute from others to make the rest of the cuts. And that's where, as I say, it gets dangerous. Why? Because there you get offsets and carbon markets to, in a sense, adjudicate those cuts and to say, oh yeah, you've bought the right to keep polluting here or to you know, have your 195% cut because you've bought the air. And I think that's the danger of the process. The one, David, that I described as a reformist reform that works within the logic of a corporate, uh, let me call it a capital of scene that's, that's threatening our, our very future. Good, I don't know if I answered you, Mindy and Seong Jin. Uh, I don't know if there's any other chats, but uh, um, oh, we, do, we do have uh, anybody else that I didn't, uh, I didn't check in on? Nope, okay. Would, maybe, would I then just, could, could yes. I uh, ask one more question maybe? Of course, yeah. Yes, in your paper, uh, you caught um, Shehan and you talk about the developmental and integrative way of thinking. Developmental way is clear, but what do you mean exactly with integrative way of thinking and integrative ontology? Could you explain well, it a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the essence of, of dialectics. Again, we've got someone like David in the house who journal has been you know, the, the single leading voice for a Marxian a dialectical approach. And I just think if we can start an integrated approach the way Helena Sheehan has done with her great book on, on, um, on Marxist science and, and her appreciation of, of Engels dialectic, then we begin to see what, what I think Harvey asked us to in 1996, that if a climate justice and environmental justice perspective claims to have the, uh, let's say, perspective on 
what ethically we must be aware of in managing these huge problems like climate crisis. Nevertheless, until there's a rational ordering, scalar coherence and a planning system, one that keeps the market at bay for sure, it has to suppress profit incentives, it has to suppress market power. It has to do all of that basically by um, invoking eco-socialist necessity. Just like in 1987, the right-wing Republicans, right, like uh, Ronald Reagan, the Tories like Margaret Thatcher, uh, the German uh, conservatives like Helmut Kohl, they realized the problem of a capital ocean, right, of corporate uh, emissions that were not being properly uh, controlled, required a Montreal Protocol, a cap and a ban not a cap on a trade, not a carbon trading or, you know, CFC trading mechanism, mm -hmm. but a ban. It's that realization. There are a few who may achieve that realization from the bourgeoisie. There's a wonderful debate about whether Michael Bloomberg, you know, an appalling character in so many ways, or Bill Gates, even more appalling, whether they can advance to the point where they understand that it's in the interest of the capitalist class to solve the problem, the capitalism, the destruction of our futures on the planet by the profit motive. And I think that's really the ultimate uh, dilemma. Hyun uh, Kan Kim is an integrated approach when we're facing such a crisis caused by capitalism, going to be an eco-socialist approach. That's the debate I'd love yeah. our comrades in climate justice, in the Fridays for Future, in 350.org, in Extinction Rebellion, in all of our climate movements and activist circles here to say, isn't it time for rational ordering or planning for eco-socialism? Thank you. <laughs> Is there any other questions? I don't see any question. Well, thank you very much, David, for your and Paul for your breakfast appearances, and for my dear Korean comrades. Um, one day we will find each other uh, in person again. Uh, Seong Jin, I sometimes would see you in London and in New York. <laughs> it was always the greatest scene that you've developed. So a big thanks for your two decades plus of organizing, of finding resources from uh, hostile Korean government, and doing such great quality work. Thank you very much. It was very great to have your talk today. And I will be very happy to meet you in person someday. And Likewise. see you someday. Yes. And all the best. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. And Jinwoo, thank you for such great technological. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you for a great talk. Okay.